And I want you to somehow make a certain leap with me. Because I have one more quotation I want to give you. And this comes from Nietzsche. It comes from Das Spektar I think. But it's been in my mind all week long. At some point, the man says, I stand before my highest mountain. And before my longest journey, and therefore must I descend deeper than I have ever before descended. Now, there's several thousand things that one has got to say in the context that we're speaking, out of which we're speaking. And I suppose the first thing that I have to suggest is that one consider the fact that in the life of a man, the life of a woman, in anybody's life, there are several elements always at work. But the crucial element I want one to, one to consider here is that element of a life which we consider to be an identity. The way in which one puts oneself together, the way one imagines oneself to be, the reality, for example, the invented reality, standing before you now, arbitrarily called Jimmy Baldwin, who contains a great many other things. We have agreed. We have succeeded in striking a certain kind of bargain with the world. This is his name, and this is what he does, and this is who he is. Okay, but that's not it. Beneath that, forever, for everybody, is something else. Is a stranger, the stranger with whom one is forced to deal day in and day out. Forced, in fact, to discover. Forced, in fact, to create, as distinct from invent. Life demands of everyone a certain kind of humility. The humility to be able to make the descent that Nietzsche was talking about. There, is, there are two ways, I think. I think there are two ways only to achieve a life or a nation. Let us consider, I'll be personal, because I think it may be the easiest way for me to say it, and the whole business of communication or communion, really, is to find some common term to make something mean to you some roughly what it means to me. In my life, as I am sure in your life, when one is young, one supposes that there is some way to avoid disaster. If I can spell that out, I mean that when one is young, when I was a little boy, for example, I used to tell my mother, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to do, 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 be this. And mama would look at me and she would say, it's more than a notion. It took me a long time, a very long time, to begin to realize that she was right and begin to realize what she meant. I, like all of us, thought I knew what I wanted and thought I knew who I was and thought that I could do it and we all do this. Whatever it was I wanted, wherever I wanted to go, I thought that I could do it without paying my dues. Because of all the things that one cannot imagine, especially when one's young, is how to pay your dues. You're, you don't even know there are dues to be paid. <laughs> and later on, one begins to discover 
and with great pain and very much against one's will. That if you want something, whatever it is you want, and whatever it is you want at bottom must be to become yourself. There is nothing else to want. Whatever that is, however, whatever that journey is, one's got to accept the fact that disaster is a condition under which you will make it, the journey I mean, not make it in the American sense. And you will learn a certain humility because the terms that you've invented, which you think describe and define you, inevitably collide with the facts of life. And when this collision occurs, and make no mistake, this is an absolutely inevitable collision. When this collision occurs, like two trains in a tunnel, one's got the choice, and it's a very narrow choice, of holding on to your definition of yourself, or saying, as the old folks used to say, and as everybody who wants to live has to say, yes, Lord which means to say yes to life. Until you can do that, you have not become a man or a woman. Now in this country, part of the dilemma, which could become a tragedy, of being what is known somewhat arbitrarily as an American, the collective effort until this moment and the collective delusion until this moment has been precisely my delusion when I was a little boy that you could get what you wanted and become what you said you were going to be painlessly. Furthermore, if one examines for a second or if one tries to define the proper noun, American. One will discover, first of all, that to be an American means a catalog of virtues. We have something called, I am an American day, which I gather is meant to reassure everybody. <laughs> And to be an American in these terms apparently means, check me out, you think about it. <laughs> apparently means that though Greeks, Armenians, Turks, Frenchmen, Englishmen, Scotch, Scotsmen, Italian, may be corrupt, sexual, unpredictable, lazy, evil, a little lower than the angels. <laughs> we are not. <laughs> Quite overlooking the fact that the country was settled by Englishmen, Scots, Germans, Turks, and Armenians, a little later to be sure. 
Every nation under heaven is here. And not, after all, for a very long time. I think that it might be useful in order to survive our present crisis to do what any individual does, is forced to do, to survive his crisis, which is to look back on his beginnings. The beginnings of this country, it seems to be, it's a banality to say it, but alas, it has to be said. The beginnings of this, of this country have nothing whatever to do with the myth we have created about it. The country did not come about because a handful of people in Europe, various parts of Europe, said, I want to be free, and probably built a boat or a raft <laughs> and crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Not at all. Not at all. In passing, let me remark that the word liberty, the word freedom, are terribly misused words. Liberty is a fact which is also used as a slogan, and freedom may be the very last thing that people want, the very last thing. Anyway, the people who settled the country, the people who came here, came here for one reason, no matter how disguised. They came here because they thought it would be better here than where they were. That's why they came. And that's the only reason that they came. Anybody who was making it in England <laughs> did not get on the Mayflower. <laughs> this is important. It is important that one begin to recognize this because part of the dilemma of this country is that it has managed to believe the myth it has created about its own past, which is another way of saying that it has entirely not denied its past. And we all know, if we think about it, what happens to a person who was born, let us say, where I was born, in Harlem, and goes to the world pretending he was born in Sutton Place. <coughs> How odd this may sound. Also happens to a nation, a nation being, when it finally comes into existence, the achievement of the people who make it up. And the quality of the nation being absolutely at the mercy, defined, dictated by the nature and the quality of the people who make it up. In this extraordinary endeavor to create the country called America, a great many crimes were committed. Now I want to make it absolutely clear, or as clear as I can make it, that I understand perfectly well that crime is universal and common. And I trust that no one will assume that I am indicting or accusing. I'm not any longer interested in the crime. People treat each other very badly and always have and very probably always will. 
I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about denying what one does, which is a much more sinister matter. We did several things in order to conquer the country. There was, at the point we reached these shores, a group of people who had never heard of machines, or as far as I know, of money. I think we would call them now a backward nation, and we promptly eliminated them. We killed them. I'm talking about the Indians, in case you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, people have done this for centuries, but I hazard, I'll bet you as you say in Harlem, I'm a fat man, that not many American children being taught American history have any real sense of what that collision was like or what we really did, how we really achieved the extermination of the Indian, what that meant. And it is interesting to consider that very few social critics, none to my knowledge, but I say very few, have begun even to analyze the hidden reasons that the cowboy and Indian legend is still one of the most popular legends in American life, so popular that it still, 1963, dominates the television screen. And I suppose, to finish off that particular item or to close it for the moment, that all those cowboy and Indian stories <coughs> are designed to reassure us that no crime was committed. <laughs> We've made a legend out of a massacre. In which connection, if I may for a moment digress, there used to be an old joke running around among Negroes. If you remember the Lone Ranger, I think he had a, I think he had a sidekick called Tonto. An Indian. There's always a good Indian. He rode around with <laughs> he, rode, he rode around with the Lone Ranger, and according to my version of the story, the version I heard, um, Tonto and the Lone Ranger ran into this ambush of nothing but Indians. And the Lone Ranger said, What are we gonna do, Tonto? And Thomas said, what do you mean, we? <laughs> now slavery, like murder, is one of the oldest human institutions. So we cannot quarrel about the fact of slavery. That is to say we could, but that's, that's another story. But we enslaved him because In order to conquer the country, we had to have cheap labor. And the man who is now known as the American Negro, who is one of the oldest of American citizens, and the only one who never wanted to come here. <laughs> Did the dirty work. Hold the cotton. Do you hold cotton? No. Chopped cotton, whatever you do with cotton. Pick <laughs> cotton. Lined track. Helped 
In fact, I think it is not too strong a statement to say, but let me put it this way. Without his presence, without that strong back, the American economy, the American nation would have had a vast amount of trouble creating its capital. If then, if one had not had the cat toting the barge and lifting the bales, as we put it, it would be a very different country, and it would certainly be much poorer. And that's all right. But the people I am speaking of who settled the country. had a fatal flaw. They could see, they could recognize a man when they saw one. They knew he wasn't, I mean, you can tell. They knew he wasn't anything else but a man. But since they were Christian, and since they had already decided that they came here to establish a free country, and some of them really meant it, by the way, the only way to justify the role this chattel was playing in one's life was to say that he was not a man. Because if he wasn't a man, then no crime had been committed. That is the basis. That lie is the basis of our present trouble. Because that is an extremely complex lie. If on the one hand, one man cannot avoid recognizing another man. It is also true then, obviously, that the man, the black man, who was in captivity and treated like an animal and told that he was one, knew that he was a man and knew that something was wrong. When we got here, those of us who survived the Middle Passage, let me tell you a very small anecdote. I was in Dakar about a year ago in Senegal. And just off Dakar, there is a very small island called Gore, which was once the property of the Portuguese. And it's simply a rock with a fortress. It is the nearest, from Africa, the nearest point to America. On this island, my sister and I went to this island. They had something called the slave house. And we went there to visit it. And the house is not terribly large, looks a little like houses you see in New Orleans. <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> it's about two stories, courtyard, staircase on each side, stone staircase. And the bottom section, which is the first story, I assume that the captains and the slavers were upstairs. Downstairs were the slave quarters, which were you walk through a kind of archway. On either side of you, very dark, very low, and this is made of stone, were a series of cells on either side. Stone floor, still rusted iron 
in the walls. It seemed to me, well, this may be my imagination, but it seemed to me that I could still smell it, what it must have smelled like with all those human beings chained together in such a place. And I remember they could not speak to each other because they didn't come from the same tribe. On either side, as I say, they are the, in this corridor, there are the cells. But straight ahead of you, you're coming through this, this archway and straight ahead of you is a very much smaller doorway made of stone which opens on the sea. You go to the edge of the door and you look down and at your feet are some black stones that form of the Atlantic Ocean bubbling up against you. And the day that I was there, that we were there, I tried, but it's impossible. Because the ocean is just the horizon. I tried to imagine what it must have felt like to find yourself chained and speechless, no serious sense of that word, on your way, where? You are listening to The Free and the Brave, a speech by James Baldwin on From the Vault. For more information or to get a copy of this program or other programs in this series, visit us online at fromthevaultradio.org or call us toll-free at 1-800-735-0230. You can research our collection at pacificaradioarchives.org. And now back to our program. In this next segment, we listen to author James Baldwin field questions from the Congregation of the Second Baptist Church in Los Angeles, April 1963. It was the black man's necessity once he got here to accept the cross, to somehow manage to outwit his Christian master, because what he faced when he got here was really the Bible and the gun. And that's all right, too. What is terrible in it is the fact that American white men are not prepared, first of all, to believe, for example, my version of this story, to believe that it happened. In order to avoid believing that, they have set up in themselves a fantastic system of evasions, denials, and justifications, which is destroyed, or is about to destroy, their grasp of reality, which is another way of saying their moral sense. What I'm trying to say is that the crime is not the most important thing here. What makes our situation serious is that we have spent so many generations pretending that it did not happen. If you doubt me, ask yourself, on what assumption rests, on what assumptions rest those extraordinary questions that white men ask. No matter how politely, on what assumption rests the question, would you let your sister marry? It's based on some preoccupation in somebody's mind. God knows, you know, I have never given any evidence of having a particular problem. I'm not interested in marrying your sister, my God. (laughs) 
I mean that. On what assumption, on what assumption, again, rests the extraordinary question, what does a Negro want? This again comes out of some extraordinary preoccupation in the mind. Something entirely, if I may say so, divorced from reality. It's like saying, what do seals eat or, I don't know. It's as unreal as unreal can be. When a baby cries, you don't ask the baby what it wants. You find out, you know, you change the baby's diaper. That's what you do, you know. You don't run to your next door neighbor and say, what does my baby want? Now let's go back for a minute to where I started. Let's go back to Nietzsche. I stand before my highest mountain and before my longest journey. And therefore, must I descend deeper than I've ever before descended. And we spoke a little earlier about the necessity when the collision between your terms and life occurs of saying yes to life. That's the descent. The difference between a boy and a man is that a boy imagines there is some way to get through life safely. And a man knows he's got to pay his dues. In this country, the entire nation has always assumed that I would pay their dues for them. What it means to be a Negro in this country is that you represent, you are the receptacle of, you are the vehicle of all the pain, disaster, and sorrow which white Americans think they can escape. This is what is meant, really what is meant, by keeping a Negro in his place. It is why white people, until today, are still astounded and offended if by some miscalculation they are forced to suspect that you are not happy in your place. <laughs> this is absolutely true, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about the Deep South. People finally say to you, but you're so bitter. <laughs> There's been in this country for a dangerously long time, two levels of experience. One, to put it cruelly, but I think quite truthfully, can be summed up in the image of Doris Day and Gary Cooper. I think you know, I think you know what they do. <laughs> and the other, subterranean, <laughs> indispensable, but denied, which can be summed up, let us say, in the tone of Ray Charles. And there's never been in this country any real confrontation between these two realities. 
let me force you or try to force you to observe a paradox. Though, though all white Americans, in essence, essentially came from Europe, it is only American Negroes whom Europe understands. Let me spell that out. When American Negroes in Europe, he and the people whom he finds himself among are able to establish a dialogue which white Americans have great difficulty establishing if they ever do. And the reason is very simple. The European and the black American know what it is to suffer. And Americans don't. Now the bill for this endeavor to get from the cradle to the grave, looking like Eisenhower, has now come in. White people are astounded by Birmingham. Black people aren't. White people are endlessly demanding to be reassured that Birmingham is really on Mars. They don't want to believe, still less to act on the belief, that what is happening in Birmingham, now I mean this, and I'm not exaggerating, there are several thousand ways to kill a man. There are several, several thousand ways to be violent. They don't want to realize that there is not one step, one inch, morally or actually, there is no distance between Birmingham and Los Angeles. Now it is entirely possible that we may all go under but until that happens I prefer to believe that since a society is created by men it can be remade by men the price for this transformation is high. White people will have to ask themselves precisely why they found it necessary to invent a nigger. Because they invented him for reasons and out of necessities of their own. And every white citizen of this country will have to accept the fact that he is not innocent because those dogs and those hoses, those crimes are being committed in your name. Black people well we have to do something very hard too, but they've done it, some of it already, which is to allow the white citizen. his first awkward steps toward maturity. But we have functioned 
in this country precisely that way for a very long time. We were the first psychiatrists in this country. <laughs> if we can hang on just a little bit longer, all of us, we may make it. We've got to try. And I think that those are the conditions. Thank you. First, I must report that there were over 100 questions asked, and we selected those that we thought uh, were more pertinent, and also that those that uh, we, we uh, put aside those who were duplicates. The first one, Mr. Baldwin, reads, could you please comment on the Muslim situation and the significance of their movement? The question about the Muslim movement posed to James Baldwin in this 1963 visit to the Second Baptist Church in Los Angeles is interesting in that in 1961, just a few years prior to that, James Baldwin debated Malcolm X on a program called Muslims versus the Sit-ins and is preserved in the Pacifica Radio Archives. The significance of the Muslim movement, it would seem to me, first of all, well, it, this, is a, this is a complicated question and a complicated answer. A, the Muslim movement came about, exists, and begins to flourish because the American Republic has never honored any of its promises, repeat, any of its promises, to its black citizens. That is its first significance to me, in my mind. It has another significance. It is, at the moment, probably the only way that a black boy or a black girl let me go back it is probably if not the only way one of the only ways that a black boy or a black girl can be invested with a pride in the fact of being black and this is extremely important The entire country, having lied, in fact, the entire white civilization, having lied about black people so long, until this very, until this very moment, this was absolutely inevitable. Now, I have no objection to those, to that. C. And this begins my objection. I am perfectly aware, or imperfectly aware, but I was born in a ghetto, raised there, and in fact, I never left it. Really, no Negro ever does if he stays in this country. I am perfectly aware, I think, of the demoralization and the despair and the destruction which is being bred in those ghettos every single hour of every single day. And I know how hard it is for any black person in this country to arrive at any sense of his own value. And yet, there are two ways to arrive at this sense. And this is perhaps rather subtle. I don't think it is, but perhaps it is. Maybe I think one of them is false, and one of them is true. What white people have done for all these generations is lie about themselves. And they put on the color of their skin 
a totally false value. They have said, in effect, for 2,000 years, they're better than everyone else in the world because they are white. And look at them. Look at the result, the spiritual, the actual, the political result. is nothing more or less than a moral and a spiritual bankruptcy. Because it is not true that the color of the skin has any importance at all in a human life. And I know that it seems to, and I know that people have perished because of the color of their skin. But it is not because of the color of their skin, really. It is because of the value placed on it. It is because of what it means in the eyes of someone else or in their own eyes. I want, from the very bottom of my heart, that black people in this country arrive at a real sense of who they are. And I, I also understand that life being what it is, and power being what it is, that it is entirely possible that the world will have to align itself for the next 2,000 years on the basis of color with the role traversed. Speaking only for myself, I would not like to see this happen. Speaking for myself, my objection to the Muslim movement is twofold. I do not see that they have an articulate program, by which I mean such things as a rent strike in Harlem. I mean a real revolution. And I do not want my nephew or my brother or my son to begin to believe that he is better than white people because he is black. I don't think that one needs to invent, I do not think the Negro people in this country have any need to invent a reason to be proud. They have achieved already, I know this is a hard saying, but this is true. They have achieved and endured and survived and triumphed over and turned to their advantage already. One of the cruelest inflictions in the history of mankind. I think that we have every right to be proud, to be proud. <laughs> that our mothers and our fathers <laughs> that our mothers and our fathers are in fact our forebears carried washing on their heads and even to be proud I hope you will understand what I mean that they knew how to say yes sir and no ma'am and get what they wanted anyway that they outwitted this civilization to the extent They are rid of this civilization to the extent that they took that and cross, they took that cross and made it something it had never been before in this country. And they took that anguish and turned it into music. And they are the only people in this country on the basis of the evidence who have been able to produce children to walk through mobs, to get to school. They're the only people in this country so far as a body who seem to have any sense of what America is about. And the American Revolution, if I may say so, depends entirely at the moment on their energy. Now this is a tremendous heritage, and I would not like to throw it away for an invented one. Is there a relationship between the African independence movement and the present day struggles of the Negro people in the United States today? That's a complex question too. And it's mainly a question which the American government is determined not to face. We are living whether or not J. Edgar Hoover likes it. <laughs> In an age of revolution, there's nothing any of us can do about that except say no or say yes. 
the 20 million Negroes in this country are not only involved and profoundly involved with the events, the revolution in Africa, but with the revolution all over the world. We have made, for the reasons I tried to outline when I was talking to you earlier, the profound mistake of thinking that when we speak, only we are listening. We have made the extraordinary mistake of assuming that what we think Cuba is, is what Cuba is. I don't know, and this is, this is really what Bobby Kennedy has in mind when he always, when he asks for a cooling off period so he won't be embarrassed before the Russians. <laughs> I don't know, speaking honestly, for example, and this is a very important example, but it's only an example. There are many, 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 many others, but we can't stay here all night. I don't know, so far, a single Negro who knows for what reason he would go to Cuba to free the Cubans. <laughs> the next two questions I will ask Mr. Baldwin to ask uh, together. The first one, what specific action can the Caucasian American take to achieve full human dignity? The next one, what specific political action can the Negro take to achieve full human dignity? I don't want to be, I don't want to sound cruel. I'm not trying to be malicious and I'm not trying to be clever. But it seems to me the first question especially, what specific action can the Caucasian American take to achieve full human dignity, occurs to me as being somewhat pathetic. I mean that. If I may be allowed to be rude for a moment, not very rude, but I'm trying to make a point. It reminds me of those people who run to doctors or other friends or, I don't know, you know. Anyway, the question comes up, what should I tell my child about sex? <laughs> and I always think, don't you know yet? <laughs> I don't think, if I may be harsh, that any white American has the right to such innocence. If you don't know what action you should take to achieve full human dignity, God knows I can't tell you. And the second question, what specific action, et cetera, can the American Negro take to achieve full human dignity, is allied to the first. Because obviously, if you don't know what you should do to become a human being, you can't imagine what I should do to become a human being. <laughs> and it is part of our dilemma that such questions can be asked. The question has to be asked of someone else, not of me, of you. My son is seven and a half years old, a Negro. He thinks white people are greater than we are. What do I say? <laughs> That's a hard question. And again, I don't want to sound harsh. But it would seem to me that the question betrays a certain insecurity on in the part of the woman or the man who asked it. 
if your child who's seven and a half thinks white people are greater than we are, it can't get be because of white people, so it must be because of you.